Speaker is Mr. Philip Goldberg, author of American Veda and Spiritual Coach. He'll be speaking on the evolution of yoga in America and the way Americans understand themselves, their attitudes about religion, and the way they engage the spiritual impulse. Also, we just want to say downstairs there's, there's pulmonary screening and yoga therapy and Ayurveda consultations just after, after the session. So, um, for the subject, we just wanted to say a quote that Vivekananda said. His quote is, you have to grow from the inside out. No one can teach you. None can make you spiritual. There's no other teacher but your own soul. And with that, we'd like to introduce our new speaker. A few days ago, when I was contemplating how I should, well, I was contemplating two things, how to, how to squeeze the content of a 30, a 350 page book into an 18 minute talk. And I was contemplating how to begin speaking about the sort of overall history of this uh, transmission of great teachings from India to America. And as I was thinking about it, someone sent me, an old friend of mine, whom I hadn't seen in a long time, sent me this in the mail, uh, in, in an email. That's me. <laughs> Forty years ago, lecturing about transcendental meditation, in Massachusetts. I was a very precocious six-year-old. <laughs> and it made, it started me thinking um, how much has changed in those 40 years, aside from my hair. Um, at that time, 1972, Meditating was a very strange thing to be doing. It was, it was strange to be doing it. It was stranger to be teaching it. In 1972, when somebody like my father was asked, what does your son do? And he said, he teaches meditation. That was a very, very bizarre thing in people's minds. At the time, most of the people we were teaching meditation to were young people, like the ones, Yale students on this magazine cover, who were inspired by the Beatles' trip to India. And so it was mostly something that students and hippies did. Now, this is the face of meditation. <laughs> it, it, a few short years after that embarrassing picture of me was taken, <coughs> meditation started to go mainstream, largely as a result of the early research that other people here at the conference uh, are speaking about now. There's over, probably over a thousand research papers on, on meditation. And back then, sometimes on weekends, we would uh, conduct weekend long meditation retreats at, a, at an old dilapidated Jesuit monastery in the Berkshires. That monastery is now the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health, where 30,000 people a year take yoga-related workshops. Back then, you had to sort of hunt around, even if you lived in Boston or New York, to find a Hatha yoga teacher. Now there are over 35,000 registered yoga teachers with Yoga Alliance and many more unregistered yoga teachers. Back then, the only kirtan you saw or heard was with the devotees of uh, Srila Prabhupada 
at ISKCON, and of course, at those days, they were mainly the butt of jokes and uh, sort of considered a public nuisance for chanting in the streets and, and the airport. Now, I just came from spending two days at Bhakti Fest. How many know Bhakti Fest? Well, you should. Christopher Chapel and I were there, and it, it's still going on. It's Thursday through Sunday, out in the high desert, two hours from LA, where images like this occur, where there's kirtan literally 24-7, and 12 hours of yoga classes a day in three different venues, and 3,000 people were there mostly young, but not only young. The young were camping, the others were in air-conditioned motels. And so these are, this is just some of the changes that just occurred to me uh, this week as I was thinking about just the last 40 years. But it's those things, the, the yoga classes, the, the meditation research, the upsurge of kirtan as a practice, these are really just the sort of tip of the iceberg when it comes to um, the real impact of, of the yoga heritage on America. They're the most visible signs. There are so many other profound and subtle signs that America is becoming, and I, I really believe this, a nation of yogis. They won't all be doing asana practice, they won't all be meditating, but in spirit, in attitude, and in their approach to their spiritual lives, their inner lives, we have become, or are becoming, a nation of yogis. And there's, there's a lot of evidence for this. When I was researching my book, American Veda, I had to, I, I looked at some of the uh, surveys of religion and spirituality over the last 30 or 40 years. And, and what becomes clear when you look at it is this shift in the direction of, of what yoga, what Hinduism, what Sanatana Dharma uh, has been teaching us for thousands of years especially since the 1960s. But if you look at how Americans view themselves, how they think of who they are and what they can become, how they engage their spirituality, how they see themselves in relation to the rest of the cosmos, you see the perspectives of primarily Vedanta and yoga with a little tantra thrown in for spice. But these are some of the directions if you look at the data. One, a move away from strictly a belief-centered religious attitude toward a, an experience-centered sense of spirituality. Away from what uh, some scholars call a dwelling religion, where identification with an institution or a religious tradition is primary to a questing or a, a, a searching kind of spirituality where personal choice and experimentation is the driving force. And away from the attitude that my religion is the one true way and the only true way to one uh, a more accept, a growing acceptance of all pathways to the divine, something very close to truth is one, the wise call it by many names as the Rig Veda <clears throat> verse is often translated. And away from a kind of a dualistic theology where God is some body separate and apart from us to a, a more of a, a unified non-dualism where the divine is both transcendent and in, imminent and where people start to have a sense of uh, even if they've never heard the expression tattvam asi, 
they start to identify the divine as within them, not just something unreachable and apart. And away from seeing the innermost self as either fallen or sinful in, in the theological sense or uh, as depraved in, a, in the Freudian sense and something more toward uh, an Upanishadic sense of, 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 of Atman as the self. Or as one clever scholar put it to me, we move from original sin to original bliss. These are discernible changes, and you can see it in the data, especially among young people, where the fastest growing category in American religion is spiritual but not religious or what some scholars call the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, for identifying with none of the above, but having a strong spiritual engagement that they value and participate in, in their own way. These are yogis, whether they practice the formal sense of yoga or not. There's a lot of reasons for these developments, some of them having to do with aspects of American culture. But I think it would, we would not be, have seen these shifts. We could not possibly have seen these shifts without the importation of yoga and Vedanta over the course of the last couple of hundred years. They have filtered into American life in ways I document in my book, and many of which were, are so subtle and so sort of invisible that many people are, in effect, yogis without knowing anything Indian is going on. They just absorb it through the culture, through their psychotherapist or their doctor or their minister or rabbi or through um, a, a, somebody they take a course with. These are subtle changes in, in worldview that have snuck in. And while it peaked in the 1960s, it started much earlier. And I'm going to um, sort of run through some of the ways it has. Of course, it came through the great gurus who came here, beginning with the first and perhaps most influential Swami Vivekananda, as you all know, I don't have to go into why he comes first in this. I always call him the Jackie Robinson of, of this great transmission. And I, it, it breaks my heart, but I speak in places where they don't even know Jackie Robinson was, let alone Vivekananda, which is a sad, a sad thing. And it came through Paramahansa Yogananda, who was called the first superstar guru of the 20th century and the first to make America his home. And then in the 60s and 70s, to a whole parade of gurus who, who became prominent, each of whom bringing out different aspects of, of the Sanatana Dharmic tradition and attracting different followers, right up to the present two most uh, best known gurus. And we will pause for a moment to admire my product placement. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, this is not Photoshop. It's just my favorite photograph. <laughs> but it also came not just through the, the obvious, the gurus and swamis and yoga masters, but Secondarily, through the people they influence and people who never met a guru because they were born at a time when there weren't any, but who had read the great literature of, of the Vedic tradition and absorbed it into their lives and their work and then transmitted it to others. And it begins in America with Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau who were reading these books in New England 200 years, well, almost 200 years ago. 
but they started to come in. Emerson's father was reading it 200 years ago. And then later, through people who were influenced by some of the swamis of Viv that followed Vivekananda in the Ramakrishna order, people like uh, Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood, who picture here with uh, Swami Prabhavananda, and people like Joseph Campbell and Houston Smith, these are giants of, of, of Western thought who absorbed Vedantic teachings, added them to the other sources of their expertise, and transmitted them to, in many cases, millions of people through television and books, and in, in Houston's case, uh, his classic uh, textbook on comparative religion. And then later, other scholars like Alan Watts, public, these are public intellectuals, and today, uh, Ken Wilbur, and it came through uh, psychologists like Abraham Maslow, who very few people, who was sort of the father of self-actualization theory and um, uh, humanistic and transpersonal psychology. Very few people know that he was studying uh, the yogic texts for his models of higher consciousness and what was achievable by human beings. And uh, Dr. Richard Alpert, who, as many of you know, became Ram Dass after meeting his own guru. And it came through people in medicine like Dean Ornish and, of course, Deepak, and now Dr. Oz, who became spokespersons and practitioners themselves. And it came uh, through the arts, it came through poetry, it came through Walt Whitman and T.S. Eliot and in more recent times Allen Ginsberg and, and many other literary figures, novelists like Herman Hesse and Somerset Maugham who wrote The Razor's Edge, which has a depiction of a guru that was ra modeled after Ramana Maharshi, and J.D. Salinger who wrote fiction about contemporary young seekers searching for moksha in the midst of life in New York and was quoting Ramakrishna and all the other great masters in his work and it came through music when the great violinist Yehudi Menuhin brought Ravi Shankar to the West and through the, the influence of his music ideas, the underlying spiritual dimension of, of Indian classical music started to be communicated and it came through jazz artists like John Coltrane and Paul Horn and John Coltrane's wife Alice, who many of you may know became a Swami and had her own ashram after a while. And of course it came through the intersection of Indian music and Western pop music and rock when sort of raga met rock when George Harrison studied with Ravi Shankar and introduced the sitar to rock and roll and started to write lyrics like the ones I, I just did a presentation at Bhakti Fest called The Beatles Yoga. And so I always call uh, George's song Within You, Without You, the first rock and roll Upanishad. And if, if you don't, go home and Google the lyrics and you'll know why I call it that. And the other thing that that musical influence did was lead to this moment when the Beatles had found a guru and started uh, meditating. And overnight, because the Beatles were who they were, uh, everybody suddenly heard that there's something called meditation and there's some sounds called mantras and people called gurus and places called ashrams. And this, like, overnight, change the perception of the world, the Western world, on the yogic tradition and what it had to offer. Because, hey, if John Lennon can do it, we should all do it. If you were young, that's what happened. And the, and the musical influence continues. Now there are kirtan superstars, all of whom were at Bhakti Fest this weekend, now attracting, instead of 10 people in a yoga studio, hundreds if not thousands of people coming to chant with them. and they doing authentic Sanskrit mantras when they chant, and there's even hip-hop Puranas. How many know MC Yogi? Okay. See, go Google MC Yogi and download some of 
his songs, and you'll hear you'll hear the story, the tale of Ganesha and the tale of Hanuman and all that in hip hop form. So you can now maybe your children will pay attention. <laughs> This continues, and of course now we know through all this evolution, the forms have changed, the delivery systems have changed, what people are drawn to seems to change, but the essential teachings remain the same, and they have had a tremendous impact on America, as, as I said. Now this, is the face of yoga in America, as we know, asana. Now, it's important to, to realize that most Americans, when they hear the word yoga, this is what they think of. They, it's come to be that asanas are synonymous with the word yoga. This is, of course, something that's troubling to many of us. At the same time, it has opened the doors to yoga, to the deeper yoga, to millions of people who might not otherwise have done it. And this is kind of the way things have always been. It's interesting to note, and I, and I sometimes have to point this out to young people, that the, the giants on whose shoulders all these contemporary yogis stand on, the ones we just saw depicted, very few of them mentioned asana. They might have taught asanas privately to some of their students. Back in the days when Yogananda was teaching, it was, see, he had asanas, but it was just, people, and there was no kirtan, except maybe the devotees would do puja once in a while. They were emphasizing meditation, and they were, and, and knowledge. And then in time, especially with the advent of the, the students of Krishnamacharya, Iyengar and Patavi Joyce, then somehow asana came into the forefront and all the Americans who were trained as yoga teachers are well trained in asana, but don't know the rest of the story that well. And that brings us to the present I always leave this up at the end as a subliminal clue, cue to so, um, the booksellers are in, in, have me remind you of books of the same. But I wanted to take the last few minutes of my 18 to talk about the future uh, as uh, part of this evolutionary process. In my mind, everybody here is a Swami Vivekananda in his or her own way. We are bringing these teachings. <laughs> Ten more minutes, it's bad. I, I really rushed. Um, we, are bring, we are the ones bringing these teachings forward, and the direction it goes now. And whether yoga will remain synonymous with asana or the, the deeper teachings will, will find their way to the fore and balance will be restored is largely up to people like us and who the people we talk to, the people we teach, the things we write. And um, ever, since, ever since American Veda came out, which is almost two years now, I've been giving these talks and going places, and, and certain things have come up. And, and so I, I feel um, compelled, even though it may, it may sound a little presumptuous, to uh, say certain things about what our task is as we, as we bring forward into uh, time these eternal, timeless teachings. And, and, and one is the need for vigilance. It's important to, to adapt these teachings to contemporary life in, the, in this strange new world in such a way that we don't corrupt them or distort them or dilute them. 
And at the same time, we need to be flexible and creative in adapting to new languages, new technologies, new cultural standards, new way of life. And one of the things I came to admire so well about the teachers who had a big impact on the West was that most of them were very skillful at doing that. They were very vigilant about not corrupting their particular lineages, but at the same time they adapted them to the West. So Vivekananda, for example, did not speak a whole lot about Ramakrishna's Kali devotion. <clears throat> that was something you learned about once you were on the inside. He emphasized the principles and the core teachings of Vedanta. And he outlined the four yogas so that, and, and emphasized practice. And he did it in such a way that was not offensive to anybody's religion, or to secular people who were very scientifically oriented. It's one of the great gifts of the tradition. It, it, it can be adapted to everybody, different lifestyles and different perspectives. Similarly, Yogananda. If you go to any of the Yogananda lineages, such as the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment down the road here, uh, and, and you go on a Sunday morning, it will look like a church service. Well, they don't have that in India. They don't have rows of pews and Sunday morning services. He adapted when he saw how Americans practice their religion. He distributed some of the teachings with mail order. Didn't do that in India. That was a new technology in the 1920s. So there's ways of adapting without compromising the integrity of the teachings. <coughs> And now, given what the situation is in yoga, we need to give people what they come in the door for, whether it's losing weight or back pain or whatever, and yet also let them know there's more. Because they'll start to feel that impulse. And we need to be conveyor belts and address people where they are. I remember when Maharishi Mayas Yogi came and started doing his lectures on TM. He spoke about enlightenment in his first lecture. And one of the questions at the end was, will meditation help me sleep? And he said yes. And the next day's headline in the local newspaper was, Yogi says meditation cures insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> and so of course the joke was, I came to wake people up and they just wanted to sleep. <laughs> So these things have to be adapted. The second thing I want to say is, if you look around here this weekend, you'll see predominantly people of Indian descent. I just came from Bhakti Fest. There were 3,000 people there. I could count the people of Indian descent on my hand. There's these two worlds of the Sanatana Dharma, and somehow, you know, all these brothers and sisters in the Dharma should need to get together more and communicate more. I know there's serious cultural differences, but that will change over time as the Indian population assimilates into America. And as Americans who practice yoga and meditation become more and more drawn to the broader teachings and maybe want to go to a Hindu temple once in a while or experience uh, a yagya or whatever, there, I, there needs to be more communication. I would, I would just urge all of us to find ways uh, to, to, to do that, and because we're all in this together. And, and another thing I want to talk about is most of the emphasis on yoga seems to be well, on individual transformation. These are powerful technologies of inner development. But it seems to me there's a social dimension that needs to be emphasized as well. And I, I, I've always felt this, but the last two weeks of political conven conventions have just forced me to say, you know, let some, we got to start being conscious about the need. I mean, there's all this talk about election reform. And we need consciousness reform. We need to really change 
consciousness in America. We need to change how people's minds work, how the, how the, how the brains work, how the heart operates in relation to other people in the natural environment. And the yogic repertoire offers us that, and we should not be shy anymore about its larger impact. And, and the last thing I want to say is, because I've encountered it, and many of you have too, was there's opposition out there. There's some opposition from secular sort of people who don't like anything having to do with religion and spirituality in the public school. But that's fine. But the other opposition is from those who think we're all doing the devil's work. We know who they are. And um, we complain a lot. But, you know, time comes when you have to stand up and, and speak the truth. One of the things that I came away, I always admired Vivekananda, but when I researched my book, um, I had to look into his life a little more deeply, and I never, I hadn't realized before how much, because we all talk about how he was embraced and how everybody <coughs> wanted to come here and speak, and, which is a remarkable thing about America. They were that open-minded, even in 1893. But there were others who were attacking him as this heathen, teaching false religion. And he didn't stand up for it. He didn't just turn the other cheek. He, he let them have it. He told them what, what they could do with their missionaries. <laughs> he, told them. he was warrior-like in standing up for, for the, the Dharma. And I think you know, we need to do the same. But to quote their own savior, we need to be as uh, wise as serpents and as gentle as doves in doing it. And, but, but it's out there. And I think you know, we shouldn't be in denial that there's people who would think who think that yoga is um, a threat. But they're dying out. <laughs> the future belongs to the yogis, I think. So I'm going, to, I'm going to close here so I get my 18, I, I can be proud of my 18 minute limit. And I guess we have some time to, to open it up. Thank you.